and um, all protocols observed and thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to stand here in front of you to talk to you about unilateral measures and sanctions. Right, so when I always start this story, I try to give the motivation for these sanctions. And so that's why I always start my story at the discovery doctrine. Why are we here? Why are we having a situation where our former colonizers, our former enslavers, are hell-bent on sanctioning us and forcing us to create certain policies in their favor? And the answer to that question is that in 1454, a doctrine was made by the Catholic Church and Pope Nicholas V because there was so much fighting on the European continent. The Renaissance had brought in so much innovation, but this innovation had depleted resources. It had polluted the environment. It had depleted everything that humanity needed to survive on. And for this system to continue to exist, it had to expand. And so this Pope said to Europeans, you've got to go and expand into lands outside Europe so that you can survive. You're fighting yourselves. You're dying of hunger. You're dying of pollution. And it's time that you go to the new world and discover new lands and take resources from those new lands, enslave the peoples of those new lands, because those new lands are unoccupied. They are terrenalius. There are no people there. So when you colonize, you colonize, enslave, and you do it into perpetuity. The United States exists on this principle. They are a colony, colonized by Anglo-Saxons, and the people and natives of America do not have rights. We call that a democracy. Canada, Australia, New Zealand exist on the same principle that believes that property rights only start with colonization. So Zimbabwe's sin is trying to reverse that injustice, trying to make sure that people remember what were the native rights. And so that's why when we went to war, fought for our independence for 17 years, and we successfully got to a point where we were almost defeating our settlers, the British and the Americans, Henry Kissinger, forced negotiations, which led to the Lancaster House Conference. At the Lancaster House Conference, we were forced into an agreement that said that we were not going to take land for at least 10 years until we rewrite our own constitution after 10 years of independence. So for the first 10 years, we used the Lancaster House Conference agreement that said that land will be taken at a willing buyer, willing seller basis. After 10 years, we now had the authority to actually take our land. But South Africa needed independence. And so at that time, the head of the Commonwealth, Omeka Anyuku, asked the Zimbabwean government to withhold, to hold back the changing of the constitution and taking of land so that South Africa can get its independence. And eventually, when that process was done, Zimbabwe had to start taking land. But it had to take land with the new rules that had been created by a new constitution that Zimbabwe was going to create. But Zimbabwe said, before we change the rules, we're going to create a new law that was called the um, Land Appropriation Act, or a uh, uh, Land Acquisition Act, that allowed the Zimbabwean government to now get land that they want, to give notice to the farmers, and to pay in Zimbabwe dollars. This was contrary to what the West wanted. Because in the willing buyer, willing seller, they forced the Zimbabwean government to pay in foreign currency, which the government did not have. So the government could not acquire land to a certain point. But now that the law had been changed after this moratorium, then the Zimbabwean government could now take land and pay in local currency and get as much land as they wanted. The Europeans didn't like that. So they asked for a renegotiation, a nullification of the Lancaster House Conference at what was called the Land Donor Conference in 1988. The Zimbabwean government and told the British government that you have to meet up with the promises that you made at Lancaster, that when we change the constitution, you will honor the deal and you will also pay money to compensate your settlers for the illegal settlement of our land and once that is done, you pay for the developments as well. The British government then began to make machinations to stop this eventuality. One, 
They wanted the removal of the Zimbabwean government. Number two, they wanted to ensure that the constitution is not changed. So they began to pay through the Westminster Democracy Fund for a group of people that were called the Civil Alliance, uh, broad, broad based Civil Alliance, to start lobbying Zimbabweans not to vote for a constitutional change. They lobbied Zimbabweans by lying to Zimbabweans that the constitutional change would give Robert Mugabe um, a presidency for life. And then they also began to tell Zimbabweans that a new political party will be created to contest the elections of 2000. While they were doing that, the United States and the West used multilateral institutions like the World Bank and the IMF to start denying the Zimbabwean government loans for reconstruction and development that were negotiated when we got independence, that the government of Zimbabwe would be given loans to rebuild the country from war and to rebuild the country from underdevelopment of colonialism on the basis that the Zimbabwean government will not require reparations for the war and, the col and colonialism. So the IMF and um, the International um, um, Development Association stopped giving Zimbabwe loans to create infrastructure. They made sure that from September of 1999, they don't give any money to that government so that there would be enough time for Zimbabwean people to be unhappy to vote for the new opposition political movement that was created two months later called the Movement for Democratic Change. Unfortunately for them, or fortunately for Zimbabweans, the Movement for Democratic Change lost elections or parliamentary elections in 2000. With that, the American government, the Europeans were not happy, so they decided that they were going to escalate their sanctions. And so they continued to remove loans to the Zimbabwean government from the IMF, from the World Bank, and other multilateral institutions, even though Zimbabwe had not yet um, defaulted on any payments. So this was tailored now to say, you've lost parliamentary elections, you are unable to change the policies of Zimbabwe, but what we're going to do is we are going to ensure that Robert Mugabe loses elections in 2002. And this is when you see that the Zidera sanctions of 2001 were imposed by the United States government to ensure that they can stop Zimbabwe officially from getting loads from multilateral institutions, but more critically, they will not be able to get debt cancellation from these multilateral institutions. This again was a contravention to the agreement of Lancaster House that got us our independence, where our government agreed that we will not demand reparations. We will re reconcile with our former colonizers and we will adopt colonial debt into Zimbabwe on the basis that when we are rebuilding this country, we're going to borrow monies that we might not be able to pay back because we're adopting colonial debt, because we're adopting the UN sanction underdevelopment that happened for 13 years to remove this colonialism, but the underdevelopment was passed on to Zimbabwe, the deindustrialization was passed on to Zimbabwe. So the agreement was they would give loans and the opportunity for cancellation of debt. The West were now undoing all those promises and trying to make sure that Zimbabwe would not be able to develop itself, but it was an abrogation of the very same laws and rules and agreements that had been made at Lancaster House. So Robert Mugabe decided we are going to take land, the land is ours, the compensation of white farmers is supposed to be done by the British, who are the um, uh, 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 mothers and fathers of the colonizers. And so if the British will not honor compensation of their white farmers, then we will simply take land because the land is ours in the first place. So the sanctions continued on Zimbabwe. When the um, Zidera sanctions failed to remove, uh, uh, to, 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 to stop people electing Robert Mugabe in 2002, then the American president declared a national emergency upon Zimbabwe. He called them an unusual and extraordinary threat upon U.S. economic interests, foreign policy interests, and economic interests. And with that, they began to cite that the government of Zimbabwe was violating human rights of Zimbabweans. And for that reason, they were going to impose not only the Zidera sanctions, which are ironically called the Zimbabwe Development and Economic Reconstruction Act which doesn't reconstruct Zimbabwe, it does not advance the economy, 
it actually destroys the country. So in the executive orders, we're now taking it a step further from just denying the government of Zimbabwe loans from multilateral institutions. They are now going to target the businesses, the um, investors in Zimbabwe, and they were going to target farms and manufacturing industries <laughs> with executive order sanctions. The executive order sanctions, after identifying Zimbabwe as a threat to the United States, then deployed a weapon to punish and to target specific industries. That weapon is the International Emergency Economic Power Powers Act. That one stops United States businesses, United States financial institutions, and any other institutions or investors across the world who want to do business with the United States from, from m making money, payment transfers, from lending money, from offering financial services, offering logistics, offering any form of product technology or even assistance or what is called material assistance from NGOs. So that is what the executive orders did. They increased those executive orders in 2005 after instituting them in 2003 and they added more people, more parastatals or what we call state-owned enterprises and financial institutions. They wanted to make sure that when we get to our next election in 2008, Zimbabweans would have suffered adequately enough through collective punishment, disproportionate and reasonable punishment and targeting of economic sanctions on civilians. Now, many people would also question that weren't these targeted sanctions? No, they were not targeted because they were in the government of Zimbabwe as Zidera was denying the government of Zimbabwe loans so that it cannot build hospitals, it cannot deliver services to its people, and so that it denies human rights and the enjoyment of human rights of all Zimbabweans. And these human rights that Zimbabweans were being denied include the right to life. But the Americans still felt that wasn't enough. So in 2008, they increased the executive order sanctions to actually create a clause in what are called EO 13469 sanctions, where they now created a clause in which they actually targeted, in which they actually now targeted the government of Zimbabwe, uh, its, its uh, municipalities, and any state-owned enterprises. No one could give them clearance, payment clearances, assistance. Even Zimbabweans were prohibited from giving services to these people. So we had gone for many years believing the allegation that the Zimbabwean government is being punished for violating human rights. We had believed this because of the media. But as time went on, we began to ask questions. Where has the Zimbabwean government, this juristic persona, been tried and proved to have violated human rights? Which court with authority and jurisdiction had actually tried the Zimbabwean government. We began to question which um, um, law was being utilized to punish, Zimbabwe, to punish Zimbabwe by collectively punishing the civilians of Zimbabwe. Then we realized that there was no court. There was no conviction of the Zimbabwean government. There was no law that was utilized, but it was the Americans utilizing unilateral power to interfere in the foreign affairs of Zimbabwe. And not only that, they were now hindering our democracy by collectively punishing the Zimbabwean people to force them to elect the opposition. And if they didn't elect the opposition, they would continue to suffer under sanctions. And when we discovered these illegalities, and we discovered the laws that had been made by the United Nations, Resolution 13469, Resolution 2721, when we understood that the UN had already started making resolutions such as 44215 in 1989, prohibiting former colonizers from sanctioning their former colonies to force them to choose and create policies in favor of them, we realized that we had a case. And by this time in 2016, Iran had gone to the International Court of Justice and began to challenge the sanctions that the United States had imposed. And by 2018, a decision had been reached that those sanctions by the United States were illegal and they were depriving civilians of their human rights. We then decided that we were going to multilateralize our fight, we were going to internationalize this fight and depoliticize it. Because all along, the Zimbabwean government was fighting these sanctions politically and not using the legal instruments. And we decided that we are going to use the legal instruments. It so happened that by the time we decided to do this, 
the, 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 we have a bank called CBZ that had broken U.S. sanctions 15,400 times. And the United States government had penalized them with a $3.8 billion that was reduced to $380 million. And by the time that they began to penalize this bank, the bank refused to pay these penalties because they said that these sanctions were illegal, they were extrajudicial, they were extraterritorial, and therefore they believed that the, uh, the bank believed that these penalties were unenforceable. And so they went, um, looked for the biggest law firm in the world, Denton's, and Denton's helped them to actually force the Americans to remove their penalties upon this particular bank. This brings me to the issue of us now deciding to take this issue to the UN. We got the United Nations to send a special rapporteur who called the sanctions illegal, say that they're violating human rights. And with that declaration, with those words, we then decided to give life by going to the courts. And we decided that the first court we're going to take this to was South African courts, because South Africa is Zimbabwe's biggest trading partner. And for that reason, the banks of South Africa are the biggest implementers of sanctions on Zimbabwe. So they are implementing illegal sanctions. They block Zimbabwean business people. They block Zimbabwean uh, government uh, institutions. And they also deny government of Zimbabwe uh, uh, loans and US dollars. Yet the South African banking system is the one that is supposed to give finances to the rest of Africa that come from the international community. And so we decided to take those banks that are instituting these illegal sanctions to court in South Africa because they are contravening the constitution of South Africa by implementing illegal sanctions and blocking people from the banking system uh, utilizing um, uh, without taking people to court. Now, the arguments that have been generated by the banks in our papers is that we are not implementing U.S. sanctions. But at the same time, in the same papers, they admit to implementing U.S. sanctions, US sanctions on corrupt individuals. And we ask them, how do you know that those individuals are corrupt if you haven't tried them? They then try and run away from the point that they're implementing illegal sanctions by saying that they are de-risking. And they are de-risking from people that could potentially be corrupt. And so therefore, they are complying with the Financial Action Task Force regulations of de-risking uh, uh, so that they do not um, have reputational risk. We believe that that is nonsense because the Financial Action Task Force regulations are not international law, they are mere regulations, and those regulations are giving banks the right to discriminate and to discriminate without trial and to discriminate, um, to discriminate unfairly. We also believe that the discrimination is also racial because when we have seen companies like Lenko breaking international law, bribing people all across the world, being found guilty in the courts of the United Kingdom and being penalized. They have, the banks of South Africa or anywhere else in the world have never de-risked from them, but every day they are de-risking from black and brown people who challenge the system or the Western system. And so we want to challenge that right of discrimination. And finally, the banks are saying, we are not discriminating, we're private organizations, and so we can choose who we can do business with. I don't think that just because you're a private organization, you have a right to discriminate. And I also believe that banks cannot qualify as private organizations when they rely on getting licenses from the constitutions of our nations and our governments so that they can serve public interest. And a bank account is a public interest and should be a right, and the banks should not be justified to close down people's bank accounts based on discrimination. These are some of the things that our face is dealing with. It's unfortunate that we didn't finish to give you the solution to some of the issues that we're dealing with, but thank you so much.